Okay, so we're just going to welcome Jeff now and let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you today. Looking back on my childhood, I think there were two things which profoundly shaped my own father's world. I don't know if you realise it, but all of us have been shaped by our family of origin. And Dad's here today. If you've still got a family that you're responsible for, you're actually shaping their family of origin. You're shaping the world uh, that that the young people are going to step into and how they see it. Whether we like it or not, uh, whether we agree with it or not, the things which happened or in some cases didn't happen in our childhood as we were growing up profoundly shaped the way that we see ourselves, profoundly shapes the way that we see the world, and profoundly shapes the way we see our place in the world. And while we can make steps to move beyond some of those things that are there, often the shadow of our family of origin continues to follow us around. Looking back now on my own family of origin, I'm sure my parents loved us as kids. I'm sure they did. We grew up on a farm just up the Richmond River, head up about 14 kilometres, and we had a sugarcane farm there. Grew up there with mum and dad, and there was three of us kids. But my parents came from a generation that often didn't express love, either verbal love or, or physical love. When I left home at 18, I shook my father's hand, and that was the first time I'd had sh shaken his hand, and that was the first time we'd expressed sort of love physically to one another at 18 years of age. I kissed my mother on the cheek as I was leaving at 18 years of age also, and that for her also was the first time that we had expressed love to one another. That was the closest we ever came to expressing love. And it's interesting when Carolyn came into our family, Carolyn came from a family that expressed love, that was, was affectionate and, and passionate and they, they would have some blow-ups but they would also have some words that they would speak kindly to one another and they were always cuddling one another. And, and when she, I started going out with her, I came along at some point and introduced her to mum and dad. And so the first thing she did was come up to dad, put her arms around him and give him a big hug. And I remember him standing there going... What, what do I do? <laughs> and uh, she hugged mum. Mum was a bit more warm. She'd be, oh, this is nice. And she stepped into that a bit more. But, but dad was, was like that. And then every time she would see mum and dad, she'd give them a big hug. And my dad began to loosen up. And after about a year or so, he would look forward to the hugs because it was something that he enjoyed and liked. That was my family of origin. And that aspect of my family origin, it, it shaped me. So even now I find I have to work at making sure that I express love to those people around me, to those people I, I do love, because my default position is to be unresponsive and unexpressive. That's my default position. So you might think sometimes, oh, I love it when he comes up and grabs my arm or gives me a hug around their shoulders. I normally have to work at that sort of thing. It doesn't come naturally and easy. It's not just in that area of expressing love, though. Sometimes I look at what I do and how I do it, and I think I'm, I'm becoming my father. <laughs> Have any of you old enough to, to think that? Any of you men old enough to think that way? You look there and think, I'm, I, that's what my dad did. I didn't like that. I said I'd never do it. And here it is, I've turned around and I'm doing that very thing I said I would never do that my, my dad actually did. My dad was born in 1918 and grew up during the Depression years. That must have been a difficult time for that generation. He was one of nine children whose parents were share farmers at Broken Head, halfway between here or closer to Byron Bay. His family was poor. His family was really, really poor. He never had shoes as a child, and he left school at nine years of age to work on the, the share farm to help support the family. He often reminded us that when we complained about going to school or we had uh, poor marks and he, he would say that your school marks should be better, he would remind us constantly that he never had the opportunity that we had and that he had to leave school at nine years of age. He tells us stories of often not having enough food, enough to eat. And uh, he said many of the meals they had were bread and dripping. Anyone here heard stories about parents having to have bread and dripping? Dripping is the leftover fat when you've cooked some sausages or some meat. And uh, nowadays we would probably throw that out because it's, it's bad fat that's going to clog your arteries up and stuff. But in those days you didn't throw anything like that away and you collected it. And they would some have sometimes all they could have for a meal was bread, no butter, no jam, nothing else, just bread with the fat of sausages spread over it. Bread and dripping was their meal. 
Growing up, Dad constantly reinforced the value of money, the values of food, and the value of a secure job. That was my family of origin, the value of money and any purchase that we had as a family. We would talk about it and he would think about it and he would look around and, and finally come to the point of making that purchase. It was a big issue for him to making a purchase. And I, I, I didn't realize that until you know, even a couple of years, probably 10 years ago, whenever Carolyn and I would buy something, if it was something we needed, it wasn't too bad. But if it was something that we didn't quite need or it was better than we actually, I'd, have, I'd be wrecked with guilt for days later. I'd be feel guilty about spending this money. I think, why do I feel guilty? And I realized it was what mum and dad had built into our world, the value of money. It's hard to come by, so don't waste it. And the value of food. They were always growing and preserving. And I remember one day we came and, and mum and dad had bought a freezer, a chest freezer. And they proceeded over the next couple of months to fill that chest freezer with food. And I think they were some of the original preppers, you know. They were, they were getting ready. They, want, they had, at any given moment, we would have six months of food in our house. We have jars of preserved uh, peaches and apricots and, and there was meat and flour. And they would buy flour in bulk and sugar in bulk and everything in bulk so that, you know, there was always food. There was this insecurity security about them, about what would happen if we didn't have the next meal. That's sort of, that's rubbed off in my world as well, as Carolyn knows. I'm always buying more than we need and putting it out the side so that we've got a little pantry that's going there in case. And she said, why do you do this? Well, that's what mum and dad did. It's the way you do things. And the value of a secure job. Dad constantly told me that I should aim at getting a government job when I left high school. Anyone else's parents said that to them? He would say over and over again, you need to get a government job. When you leave high school, you need to go and be trained and get a government job because a government job to him meant security. He said when, when, when a depression comes or when people are laid off, the last people who get laid off are the government employees, he said. So growing up poor during the depression years shaped my father, which in turn shaped my life. That was the first thing that shaped his life. The second thing that shaped my dad indelibly was World War II. Dad enlisted in the army in 1939 and served until 1945. He served in Europe and Africa and Asia, but he always refused to talk about it, would never say anything about it. As kids, we wanted to know what it was like. What was it like in the war, Dad? Where had you served? And we wanted to know if he had lost friends or if he'd been in a battle. We wanted to know what it was like, this thing called war. But Dad never spoke about it. We know he'd been shot in the leg because we saw the bullet hole in his calf when he had shorts on. But he just wouldn't talk about it. In his last years, he was quite unwell. And my brother went to him at one point and, and said to him, that dad, it was a, a son's right to know what had happened to his father during the war. He needed to know. He wanted to know. Please, dad, tell us about the war years. I, I, I need to know as your son. But dad said back that it was his right to keep some things to himself. I don't know what happened to dad in the war. I, I don't know how to find out what happened to him. But something happened over those six years which indelibly changed him. Every year, dad would attend Anzac Day. And he would attend the dawn service either in Wardell or Broadwater, sometimes in Ballina. And then he would march in the Anzac Day Parade down River Street with his medals on. And he was very proud of being able to do that. And then he would go to the Ballina RSL Club after the march. And then he would drink there all day until he was very, very, very intoxicated. It always seemed strange to me as a young guy that he would go to the dawn service and parade to remember the war... And then he would go to the RSL club to try and forget the war. It seemed like a, a funny contrast. But it wasn't just Anzac Day. Out of those six years, something had changed on the inside. And it wasn't just Anzac Day, it was most weekends that he would drink to excess. Sometimes... He would drink and he knew he was too intoxicated. I have a memory of around 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age. He would go into the hotel Friday and Saturday nights and sometimes if he'd had too much to drink, mum would have a phone call and he would say, send Jeffrey in to get me. And so I would hop on my bike and in the dark, 
Without a bike light, I would ride the, ride the road into Wardell. It was about five kilometres away and put my bike in the back of the car and, and then go and get Dad from the pub and bring him out and put him in the car. And, and then I would drive, just like some, when I was young, just looking over the steering wheel because we lived on the farm, so I knew how to drive a tractor and drive stuff, but it was still a bit scary. My biggest fear was that the police would catch me. So I, I figured they might catch me and put me in jail for being an unlicensed driver. So I was really, really fearful of the police. And I'd be riding in to, to get him and just being sort of worried and anxious and, and fearful. And that was uh, a lot in my 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age. It was most weekends, but in a really bad season, it could be most days when Dad would do that. And I grew up quite frightened and fearful of my father. There was this dark shadow that was in his life that we could sense, especially when he was drinking. I remember once when I was six years of age, our little fox terrier dog ate some poison. Dad was always poisoning things on the farm. There was always some animal trying, so we'd poison the rats, we'd poison the red bills, poison the crows, poison the snakes. Poison. He always had poison around the place. Strychnine was a part of our upbringing. And uh, I remember when I was six years old, I had a little fox terrier dog, and this uh, Spark was our, our little dog, and I was the oldest, and uh, so he was sort of my dog, and he was my best mate, my best buddy, and we'd do everything together, and I loved that little dog so much. And I came out one day, and the dog's having a seizure on the, the backyard, and somehow or other he'd picked up one of these baits and chewed it or swallowed it, and so he was poisoned, and, and he died. And I remember just being so devastated by the death of this little dog. It's like, you know, something about dogs, isn't it? You get attached. I get attached to them. Don't get so attached to cats. But dogs just seem to work their way into your heart and into your life. And, and they're just you know, so amazing. I was so upset. <clears throat> and I remember my dad being gruff with me. I was trying to get hold of my emotions, but I was like really, really upset. And, but Dad was gruff with me. There was no sympathy. There was no uh, affinity. There was no, there's another word I'm searching for that's uh, empathy. That's the word, John. Thank you. Uh, which was really hard for me to process as a six-year-old. Why was Dad gruff with me? And it was obvious to me that, that my, my display of emotion over Sparks' death was, was not welcome. Dad didn't know what to do with that and couldn't actually handle it. It taught me to keep my emotions inside, uh, which is not a good lesson for a six-year-old to learn. Now, my dad was a good man. He wasn't a bad man. Imperfect, yes. Uh, flawed, yes. He was deeply flawed in lots of ways. But I believe he was trying his best with what he had. And uh, it was strange, he did mellow over the years. He did mellow, and in his later years, especially when grandchildren came along, he mellowed much more, and he became a, a, a much nicer person, a different person. And some of those things that I had to deal with, I think somehow grandchildren softened him a little bit and uh, really helped him. You know, all of us here had or currently have fathers who are or were imperfect. We all grew up in homes where there were imperfect parents, imperfect fathers. Some tried their best, some dads tried their best, some dads didn't try at all, and some dads were somewhere in between those two. And all of us carry the effects of that in some way in our lives. Our family of origin, and particularly our fathers, have affected us in many ways. When I was 17 years of age, something happened in my world that changed my life totally. My best friend, Mark, had become a Christian six months earlier. And he started to tell me about Jesus. Started to tell me, I decided gone through a Catholic school up until the age of 12. And at the age of 12, I decided it was all a load of rubbish and that I declared myself to be an atheist. I started reading atheist books. And uh, I think my favorite at the time was Eric Von Daniken wrote a book called The Chariots of the Gods, which claims that uh, the people that they worship as gods were actually space people who'd come from outer space. And, and that was an interesting book. They actually made a movie about it. Well, But that sort of gave me permission to turn my back on God and to declare myself an atheist. And so there was lots of stuff that I did that, that wasn't good there. But as my friend Mark began to talk to me about Christianity and about Jesus and the, the change that had happened in his world, and then I started to go out with Carolyn, and she knew about some of this Jesus stuff as well. And she was telling me about Jesus. And so during lunch times in year 12, not every lunchtime, but occasionally I'd go up to the school library and find a, a Bible that was there because I hadn't seen any other Bibles in my world. And I'd start to read through some of the, the New Testament and ask myself, you know, what's going on here and why is this? 
The end result of that was in 1975, in October, I asked Jesus to come into my life, 17 years of age. My life suddenly was turned around. For me, it was like an alarm clock waking me from a deep sleep. I felt alive for the first time, fully alive for the first time in my life. I felt whole, fully whole inside for the first time in my life. I felt purpose for the first time in my life. I was so excited about this relationship with Jesus. I, I become my, one of those Jesus fanatics who kept on telling people, if I, could, if I could get your ear, because it was so real to me that I wasn't a believer and I knew what that, what that was like. And now I was a believer and I knew what was, that was like. And if I can talk to you, I can help you make that transition as well from being someone who doesn't know about Jesus to someone who does. So I became a, a little bit fanatical, a little bit fanatical talking to my schoolmates who all thought we'd gone crazy. I uh, went to university at Lismore. In the first six months of university in Lismore, I must have led a dozen, if not 20 people, to know Jesus Christ. I was praying for people. They were being healed. We started a home group up there in Lismore that eventually became a, a significant church in the region, all because I was so excited and passionate about Jesus. And I found Jesus was leading me and guiding me. That somehow I would, I would see coincidences and I would say, oh, that's Jesus in the middle of that. Or there would be an impression that I would follow. Or circumstances would just work out. And I also found something else that was new. I found that I had a heavenly father. At first, I found the thought of a heavenly father quite challenging. Because of my relationship with my natural father, I began to project onto that my relationship with my heavenly father. And so I thought of my heavenly father as being a little bit scary, a little bit aloof, a little bit frightening, a little bit, uh, Jesus, I can get, yeah, thank you, Jesus, you're in my heart, you've made a difference in my world. But this father guy, I'm not too sure about the heavenly father guy. He's a bit, bit scary, I think. But what I've discovered is that our heavenly father is not like that. Today, it doesn't matter in one sense what your relationship was like with your natural father. It doesn't matter in one sense what your family of origin is actually like because each one of us have been transferred into a new family. We've been transferred into a spiritual family and we have a new spiritual family that we belong to with a, with a new family. And we have a, today we have a heavenly father who loves you and who loves me and he loves us unconditionally with no strings attached. And you might have grown up in a family where your natural father didn't love you, didn't know how to express love. But I want to say today that there's a heavenly father who loves you intensely who loves you passionately, who loves you with so much love and so much care over your life. And today, if you'll open your heart to Him, if you'll receive Jesus into your heart, then we also receive our Heavenly Father and we can know what it's like to be truly loved, even if we've grown up not experiencing what that love is like. See, there's nothing you can do that would cause your Heavenly Father to love you less. And there's nothing you can do that would cause your Heavenly Father to love you more. He affirms you and he loves you. No matter how many times you fail, no matter how many times you make mistakes, no matter how many times you think, oops, I told myself I wasn't going to do that again. Your Heavenly Father always has your best interests at heart and he affirms you. And even when it feels like your world has fallen apart, he's there to help you pick up the pieces and to keep going. Our text today comes from Psalm 103. Might put that up there, please, Asher. And this is, I'm going to read it because it describes our Heavenly Father. And it says about our Heavenly Father, it says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Your Heavenly Father will not constantly criticize you, nor will He hold a grudge forever. Your Heavenly Father does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve the voice says there in his mercy he tempers justice with peace verse 11 for our heavenly father his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west what an amazing description of our heavenly father and of the love that he has for us and in verse 8 there it says, The Lord is compassionate, merciful, slow to get angry and filled with love. Maybe your natural father had a short fuse. <laughs> 
Anyone have a, don't put your hands up. Did any of us have a, a father with a, a short fuse? You know, just the, the slightest thing, you would do something wrong, bang, it would blow up. And, and he would be sorry afterwards that something had happened in his family, in his world, his circumstances. And, and so you press that little button and boom, up it explodes. Your heavenly father doesn't have a short fuse. He has a long fuse. Maybe your natural dad was quick to get angry. Maybe he shouted at you. Or maybe you're sitting here today and thinking, my goodness, I, I, I wish you'd stop talking about, about dads and stuff because my father shouted at me and he abused me verbally and said things that I wished he hadn't said to me when he was angry. I want to say that that's not your heavenly father today. Your heavenly father is not shouting at you even when you do things wrong. Your heavenly father has a long fuse. Or maybe our natural father had a long memory. Ever had one of those parents or school teachers or whatever who have long memories and they keep a record of all your wrongs and they go, yeah, Brett Whitaker, I remember when you were in fourth grade and you did this and you did that. and yeah, Whittleton, sorry. You did this and you did that and this wasn't right and that wasn't right. And, and some, some parents, they keep a list of the wrongs, don't they? Some husbands and wives do that as well. No one here, of course. And so... You know, maybe our natural father had a long... Every mistake or poor choice you made was brought out to make a point. And there's a long list of them from over the years. But it says this in verse 9, if we can put up Asher, that our heavenly father is not a constant critic and doesn't hold a grudge forever. Oh, wow, maybe that's amazing. He, has a long, he doesn't have a long memory, he has a short memory. He, he, he forgets, uh, he has a short memory. Every day we have a fresh start. There was that song we used to sing back in the 70s, as I'm often reminding you. His mercies are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. We'll have to resurrect some of these, Luke, and teach you some of the, the great old choruses of the past. They're new. His mercy is new every morning. When you hop up of a, new, of a morning, it's a fresh day. And the, the Bible says Jesus, uh, he forgets about the previous day. That's gone. And he gives you a fresh start to this day to, to, to walk with him and to do stuff. Mercies are new. Or verse 10 that says, God doesn't treat us as we deserve. Isn't that, aren't you glad God doesn't treat us as we deserve? Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Man, this is, this is um, sometimes, you know, if, you know, you rouse on your kids sometimes and you give them a whack or whatever is politically correct to be able to do that today. And, and we say, well, you deserve that. You were, you were rebellious or you, you back answered or you, 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 uh, you did that thing I told you not to do and you always know there's consequences and so you, know, you deserve to get that smack or whatever it is that, that you did. And, but God, God doesn't treat us as we deserve. Maybe your natural dad was super strict. Every time you stepped slightly out of line, down came the punishment. The slightest little thing wrong, bang, there was the punishment. God's not like that. He's got a thick skin and is wonderfully patient and kind, even when we don't deserve it. And lastly, God, this Psalm 103 tells us God has a big heart. Verse, whatever it is, uh, the next one there, Asher, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him, is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth, and he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Wow, what amazing thing. In high school, um, it reminded me as I was reading that in high school we studied a poem by Samuel Taylor Coolidge. Anyone guess what it's called? Yes, John, very good. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And uh, I enjoyed, thanks, McKeel. Very well done, it's good. <laughs> And it's the story of a sailing ship written in 1797. It's a poem. And the ship is blown off course into the Antarctic. And, and when it seems like they will be crushed in the ice and they'll perish, an albatross appears. And the albatross leads them out of the ice and to safety. And the mariner, one of the crew, he decides that he's going to kill the albatross. So he shoots the albatross with an arrow. With the albatross gone, the boat is in serious trouble, becomes becalmed, and they are now facing death from thirst. I'll read you a couple of stanzas because I, I love this poem. It says, Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot 
O Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. Here's this albatross that's now been killed and so they're in deep trouble. They've been becalmed. They've got no water to drink. They're dying of thirst. And as punishment, the crew forced the mariner who shot the bird to wear the dead albatross albatross around his neck. And he's got this thing, this dead, big dead bird tied, and he's forced to carry that around. The poem goes on and says, Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. His sin... He killed that bird. He shouldn't. It was his sin, his guilt. His evil is constantly with him. It hangs around him as a a, a dead thing, as a smell, as a, a thing that's there. He can't escape it. But that's not how God sees us. He doesn't see your sin hanging around your neck. You don't have to carry it on a bag in your back. You don't have to be burdened down or weighed down by it. The Bible says that if you confess your sins to Jesus, if you'll trust in him, he says your sin will be as far as the east is from the west and as high as the heavens is from the earth. That's how far that is from you. Poor mariner with the albatross around his neck. Jesus sets us free. He removes our sin far from us. Our heavenly father has a long fuse. He has a short memory. He has a thick skin and he has a big heart. And today we can come boldly to him. We can come right into his presence. And maybe we had an imperfect father who left a shadow on our lives, but today our Heavenly Father wants to shine His light, His presence into our hearts and lives. Would you stand with me this morning, please? And maybe that's you today. Maybe as we're standing together, you think, wow, (laughs) yeah, my my dad, uh, there were some imperfections that I'm still wrestling with a little bit today. Just right in this moment, just open your heart to your Heavenly Father. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you you love me unconditionally. I thank you you don't keep a record of my wrongs. Lord, I thank you you restore my heart and you restore my life. And Lord, I receive the the miracle working power of a Heavenly Father who loves me deeply into my heart and my life right now. Father, I pray for every person that's reaching out to you this morning. On this Father's Day, when we celebrate natural fathers, Lord, I thank you on this Father's Day that we also celebrate our Heavenly Father, Lord, who loves us and who cares for us, and we find whose hand is upon our life, helping us to put the pieces back together, helping us to journey through life. So, Father, I thank you for every person gathered here this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Just why every eye is closed. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you've never experienced what I did at Spirit at 17 years of age, you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, and today you feel and sense the Spirit of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart, I want to give you an opportunity in just a moment to raise your hand and say, Jeff, that's me. That's me today. I want to ask Jesus into my life. Or perhaps you've done that at some point, and you know you've drifted away from the reality of that and you found yourself just doing stuff that you you know is not pleasing to God and today you'd like a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance however many chances it be and today you'd say Lord today I want to recommit my heart to being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ if that's you either for the first time or as a recommitment just while every eye is closed just raise your hand give me a wave today and say Jeff that's me thank you is there anyone else today thank you Father God, I thank you today for your presence in each of our lives. Lord, I pray as we celebrate our natural fathers today, Lord, that we would sense the the presence of our heavenly Father, Lord, touching us and resonating in our lives. Lord, I pray in this next week, Lord, we would have not only an awareness of what it means to be touched by the Holy Spirit, not only an awareness of what it means to know Jesus, but in this coming week, we would know what it is to experience the love and the acceptance and the the pleasure of our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you're so proud of your kids. You're so proud of everyone that's gathered here this morning. Lord, who calls upon the name of Jesus. Lord, you're so proud of us. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I commit each person, Lord, today into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you on this Father's Day. Thank you for coming.
And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. If we can pray with you over anything. If you're facing challenges or perhaps even in the talk today, something stirred in your heart, I'd love to pray with you over that. So God bless. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you in church next Sunday. Falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to me. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to me. Come on, church, your name. Because your name is the highest, your name.